Good morning, everyone. This is Lauren Nichols with the American Carbon Registry. Uh, welcome to this webinar on our brand new quantification methodology for biochar projects. I want to thank everyone for joining today to learn about this new, very interesting and innovative methodology. Um, I'm going to start by providing a brief introduction with some logistics of the webinar itself and a little bit of background on ACR and Windrock. Um, then I'm going to hand it off to the methodology authors to cover the meat of the methodology itself. Um, first to Teresa Koper from the Climate Trust, who will present the basics of the methodology and what it applies to. Um, then to Keith Driver of the Prosino Group, um, who will present the details of um, the greenhouse gas quantification methodology. Um, and next to Debbie Reed from the International Biochar Initiative, um, who will discuss the issue of carbon stability. And lastly, Stefan Yurka, also of the International Biochar Initiative, um, who will discuss feedstock sustainability. Um, and we will plan to close the presentation with at least 30 minutes for question and answer. So um, you will have plenty of time to um, pose questions. Okay, so um, oops. so just first a little bit about the webinar logistics. Um, there are two ways to ask questions. Um, in your webinar pane, you should see near the bottom um, of the screen there a chat box um, in which you can type your questions anytime during the presentation. They will come through to me, and um, at the end of the presentation, I will start asking any that have been submitted um, and, and direct those to the appropriate person. Um, if you would prefer to ask your questions verbally, you um, can see in the upper left corner of your webinar pane a little hand. Um, and you can click that hand to hold your place in line until I call on you during the Q&A period. Um, and at that point, I will unmute you so you can ask your question yourself. Um, I also want to point out to everyone that um, this methodology is currently open for public comment through November 22nd. So, um, of course, part of the, the purpose of this webinar is educational, educational and to present um, the new methodology, but also to um, get feedback on it um, and any questions that are covered during this webinar will be included in the public comment documentation posted with the methodology itself. On on our website. Um, if you would like to provide other comments or ask additional questions that um, this format, um, oh, you know, beyond what this format allows, you can um, feel free to go to the ACR website, find the public comment draft of the methodology, and um, find directions on how to submit those additional comments. Um, but um, regardless, all the public comments, whether submitted to us in writing, or during the presentation today will be addressed by the methodology authors. Um, also, I want to um, just give a heads up that part of the presentation later on will be actually referencing um, some pages of, of the um, methodology itself. So if you would like to go ahead and go to the ACR website under the methodology sections to pull up the public comment draft, um, feel free free to please go do it, do that now and, and have that ready. Um, finally, I just want to mention that today's webinar will be recorded and both the audio recording and the PowerPoint will be made available to all the registrants after. Okay, so quickly I just want to provide a few slides of background. Uh, first, on on the Winrock International Institute for Agricultural Development, which is the parent nonprofit organization um, of which the American Carbon Registry is part. You can see at the top of this slide Winrock's general mission statements. Winrock works globally in about 60 countries um, with around 1,000 staff, and our mission overall is to empower the disadvantaged, increase economic opportunity, and sustain natural resources. Um, Winrock was formed in 1985 from the merger of three predecessor organizations that were all fam Rockefeller family organizations um, devoted to international development, agriculture development, and food security. Um, it's headquartered in Little Rock, Arkansas, and Win Winrock is actually short for Winthrop Rockefeller. 
who was uh, sort of the black sheep of the five Rockefeller brothers who left the East Coast, moved to Arkansas, and began raising cattle. Um, so as an organization, climate change and its impacts, particularly on disadvantaged communities, is um, of great concern. Um, and we think that as it progresses, the impacts will be differentially worse on a, on a lot of the populations in the developing world. So um, that has been a focus of Win Rocks for many years, and um, many of the programs Win Rocks supports, including um, clean energy, forestry, and natural resources management, and of course the, the American Carbon Registry itself are geared toward trying to um, respond to that problem. Um, we also believe that market mechanisms can and often be um, an efficient means to both um, improve uh, the environment and to alleviate poverty. Okay, so um, the American Carbon Registry was um, is the, the first U.S. voluntary carbon registry founded in 1996. We've registered since then um, about uh, 38.6 million metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalents, um, verified greenhouse gas reductions, um, and you know spread across a wide variety of project types. Um, overall, the main roles of the American Carbon Registry are to um, one and uh, develop and approve carbon methodologies. Uh, we develop some new methodologies in house, um, and others like the one that you will hear about in today's presentation are brought to us from external authors. Um, all are put through a rigorous review process, including a public comment period and scientific peer review process. Um, we also review the projects that are developed against these approved methodologies, um, which are then validated and verified by accredited um, independent third-party auditors. So we oversee that um, that process as well. Um, and finally, um, a, a key role of the registry is to issue and transparently track the credits resulting from these projects and the associated transactions and retirements of those credits. Um, ACR was approved by the California Air Resources Board last year um, as an offset project registry and an early action offset project or excuse me, early action offset program uh, for the California cap and trade market, um, meaning that projects that are developed under the offset protocols approved by ARB, as well as those that are developed using the early action protocols recognized by ARB, um, can come to ACR to be listed, go through the verification process, and then be issued registry offset credits that are eligible to be converted into ARB offset credits and used by regulated entities in the, cap and, the California cap and trade market. Um, as far as um, prices, um, according to the ecosystem marketplace, um, the average price in 2012 was $7.40 per ton um, across all ACR voluntary transactions, um, which was up a little bit from the reported 2011 average of 570 per ton. Okay, so um, just a, a couple comments quickly about um, why Winrock and ACR are interested in this methodology um, and are excited to see it through. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Winrock's roots are really in agriculture research and rural economic development. So um, from the very start, Winrock has been looking at ways to um, improve ag production um, that also benefit the environment, and specifically in ways that also connect farmers with new markets. So um, the work that ACR is really um, is, is doing these days on this and other agricultural and land use methodologies really um, stems from that same tradition. Um, we're look, looking into how we can promote innovation in this sector, how we can promote practices that sustain or improve the environment, um, and how we can use markets, um, in this case, 
markets for greenhouse gas credits as a means to create incentives for um, farmers, ranchers, landowners to undertake um, beneficial practice, new beneficial practices. Um, we know that the science for this particular topic is challenging, um, but we are excited about working with the top experts in the field to bring to market a first of its kind carbon methodology for biochar projects. Um, so that is all I'm going to say. I'm going to pass it on to um, Teresa Coper from the Climate Trust, who's going to start with um, the details of the methodology. And um, Teresa, please take it from here. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Let me just move our slides. Well, I wanted to thank everyone who's joined. We are excited about this opportunity and appreciate your willingness to help us make this the best methodology possible and the most user-friendly. This is a methodology for biochar production to reduce greenhouse gases by sequestering primarily carbon. I want to also thank the Blue Moon Fund for supporting the development of this methodology. This method methodology was designed to be applicable throughout the U.S., but not limited to the U.S. Now I'll go through some of the requirements. Projects must comply with the ACR standard. Utilizing a qualified sustainable feedstock, which Stefan will explain in more detail later in this presentation. Adhere to the International Biochar Initiative Standards. And annually submit compliance documents prior to registering offsets for that year and must submit a greenhouse gas project plan for certification by ACR. The project must be validated and verified by an approved ACR verification and validation body. Next slide, please. For quality control, the product must be tested for hydrogen to organic carbon ratio. And the product must have a ratio of 0.7 or less to qualify. This methodology is specific to biochar that is intended as a soil amendment as its greatest potential for offset greenhouse gases, offsetting greenhouse gases. And proof will be required. The operation shall meet all air quality standards for that, that location. And the biochar production facility must operate under all applicable facility permits and regulations. There must be an uncontested and exclusive ownership of the greenhouse gas credits. And that must be demonstrated. And now I'll pass it off to Keith Driver, who will discuss quantification of greenhouse gas emission reductions. Thank you very much. So, hi, it's Keith Driver here from the Presino Group. I'm just going to roll through some of the more technical elements of the protocol. Uh, although I can't see the questions coming up, I'm sure there are some. Um, if there's some on the applicability, I, I'd be open to, to pausing to answer those now, or we can continue. Okay. So what you see in front of you here is the diagram from page 15 of the protocol, which outlines the project boundaries. And this speaks to what Teresa introduced before, which was what types of projects are we looking to cover? There are all sorts of uses for biochar that are go beyond what may be covered in this protocol, i.e., uh, you know, all poodles are dogs, but not all dogs are poodles. We've got, um, uh, in this case, we've had to segment the biochar um, potential list of projects down to those that will get to soil. And the reason for that is once biochar is, is um, mixed with soil, it becomes inert and can't be burnt largely. Uh, and therefore, its, it's end, 
end point uh, is, is relatively assured at, at that point. So we take, uh, as we view the whole process for the project condition, we take everything from the sustainable feedstock production and transportation through the pyrolysis process, the either the biochar you know, uh, blending, the syngas processing, bio processing, through into their eventual use. And what's included in the dotted lines in this diagram um, is meant to illustrate what parts of this we are including as being within the project boundary. And this becomes important later when we, we uh, in the protocol, when we look at what items over which we have control and what items over which we uh, may wish to uh, or, or need to quantify. So as you can see, there's quite a number of elements, electricity, auxiliary fuel use, any drying or processing of the feedstock, all the way down to the use of the three streams, the liquid, the gas, and the uh, solid stream that, that can come off of a biochar project. So we've got some temporal boundaries. Oh, this finger. So the project start dates, uh, American Carbon Registry has its own requirements, and I would uh, suggest referring directly to those for project start dates and requirements around the qualification for the system lower run into some of those. But from the period that the project is eligible, there's a period of seven years. And that's the period under which the project component is uh, able to, uh, as long as they meet the verification uh, requirements uh, based up against the protocol, will be able to receive credit from that period. So it isn't an, it isn't an indefinite period, but it is seven years, which provides some certainty. And that's a programmatic choice within American Carbon Registry. As far as the baseline concerns, really there's two baselines that are provided in this protocol. The first is meant to be the simplest of, of approaches, keeping in mind the scale at which biochar production is happening today. So the first one is a combustion of the feedstocks that would otherwise have gone to some other bioenergy production facility. And this may seem at first blush like a very odd baseline to consider. And the baseline being, you know, what would have happened in the absence of the project? But when we when we apply the principles of ISO 14064 Part 2, which is the ISO standard for GHG, one of the key uh, themes or, or requirements is to be conservative. And if we don't want to have to chase down every piece of feedstock and where it would have otherwise gone, the the the, um, the most conservative baseline to choose is that that material would have otherwise gone into bioenergy production somewhere. So it's not necessarily the most likely, but it is the most conservative. And therefore, it allows us to simplify um, the quantification. If you just wish to go ahead uh, and type that in the baseline, this is the easiest one. It also allows for the layering of, of uh, stacking of other uh, environmental credits that might come from biochar production in terms of fuel and um, or fuels or other energy uses that may come from that. So, what it does, though, is results in the exclusion of the electricity, the heat, and the bio oil, um, as well as the methane generation of waste. So this is the easiest, the simplest, but it can, for a lot of the more, perhaps more sophisticated or integrated projects, leave some value on the table. The alternative baseline is to go into each of those areas and prove out the, the baseline condition, whether there, the material was otherwise going to landfill and is now being avoided. And that's, that's possible, but it does provide a high burden of proof for those items because there is additional value and we need to make sure that there isn't uh, quote, quote, either positive or negative leakage, leakage the concept I'll get to in a minute, around initial reductions that are either over or underestimated um, as, as we go. So here we get to additionality. Oh. The two fingers. Additionality. And additionality for those that maybe are new to the carbon um, offset world is sort of the, uh, it, it's, it's a major consideration in ensuring that there's integrity within the offset system. So there's a, a stepwise approach to ensuring that the project is additional relative to requirements of the protocol. Apologies. The first is to identify the alternative scenarios and make sure they're consistent with current laws i.e. you can't get credit for breaking the law. Um, there are some cases where, uh, where laws aren't enforced, but this doesn't apply in the U.S. and really doesn't apply in, in many jurisdictions. Step two, barrier analysis to eliminate alternatives to the project activity. So there's a, a test in there to look at, it's called a barrier analysis, and we look at things like technical um, 
risk or, or project development risk, i.e. in the biochar space, one might look at it and say, well, no one else is building really massive biopyrolysis units at this point for biochar. There's, there's a barrier to setting up these projects. Um, that's where that would come forward. An investment analysis to show that you, uh, whether this project uh, needs the um, revenue from offsets to, to um, um, in order to um, be additional, i.e. different from what would have happened up there. No, you don't have to tick all of these boxes, but we go through in a stepwise approach in terms of understanding what the landscape looks like. So the project may make financial sense without the offsets, but there's certain barriers which would trigger you to have a higher uh, requirement for return in order to manage the risk. And then there's a common practice analysis. I think most people on the phone who have been involved in the biochar industry would suggest that we haven't yet to hit common practice, although it is a lofty stretch goal that we would have out in the long run. And so this, uh, there's a tool out there and there's a bunch of best practice around how to apply it, but really the protocol does nothing new in this space except just apply what's out there. Um, so there, there are folks out there that understand this in terms of how you determine that the project is additional. We, in this case, we rely on a tool from the United Nations Framework and Climate uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change, UNFCC. So for quantification, and this is a real basic slide, and I'll get into it in more detail. Um, this is where I, I want to highlight two things on this page. One is the last line. Emission reductions are baseline emissions minus the project emissions minus that's any leakage that might happen. So let's break that down. The baseline emissions are the emissions that might have, that would otherwise have happened. And I'll, I'll paint a, an example here, which is the, the, the waste would have, uh, the, the peat stock would otherwise have gone into a landfill and been treated as waste and would have generated the methane emissions coming off it. Under the project condition, we pyrolyze that material and we capture that carbon. So you have a high emissions minus a low emissions in the project condition and the gap between those is your emission reduction. And then we have this little catch-all of leakage which says if there's anything in the system where because we're doing uh, this activity over here, because we're um, putting this biochar facility over here, we're now going to have to cut down trees over there to make uh, feedstock for uh, the other bioenergy facilities. It, it allows for that making sure there's no unintended consequences. So if we start at the top of the slide again, we look at the baseline condition. You can see under the simplest of the baseline conditions, as I mentioned earlier, the baseline emissions are equal to baseline emissions associated with this material being used for bioenergy production. Very simple, one thing, uh, one element to look at. Uh, we'll get into the default values that help make that a little bit easier. If we go to the uh, alternative baseline, which is to look at uh, whether that material was anaerobically decomposing, or whether there was electricity or gas or oil being produced, you can see that it very quickly becomes a, quite a complex equation where you've got, as opposed to one thing where you've got one area where you need to do some quantification, you've got two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, um, eight particular elements that you either need to include or exclude depending on whether they're applicable to the project. And for those that are having trouble maybe reading the subscripts on those, really it's the baseline emissions is associated with the aerobic decomposition of that material. The baseline emissions is associated with the anaerobic. You just stack them all up. And they, it's the sum of the total is the, uh, uh, the, the sum of them that it creates the, the total baseline emissions for what would have happened. What you need to understand, though, is that in each of those, and in, in the, the protocol itself, and we'll get to it in a minute, there's an equation and a set of variables that all need to be tracked and captured and moved forward. Things like temperature, mass, water content, uh, and, I, and I go on, uh, organic fraction, these sorts of things that you have to measure. So every time you add one, it add, may add value but it also adds a certain element of complexity. And then under the project condition, well, these are things that, that we can typically measure and monitor during the operation of the project. And you'll notice that they're all labeled PE except for the last one, and that's the one that uh, we'll be talking about a little bit, which is how much is sequestered as carbon within the, within the biochar. And this is, a, uh, this is a, the, the crux of it, um, the crux of the protocol um, in some ways. Uh, and so we'll go into that a little bit detail and separate it out. Bear with me while the slide changes here. Let's 
So the, the issues related to leakage that have been identified, there's really three of them that, that illustrate what leakage can be. First is that we restricted the use to purpose-grown biomass. And the reason for that is if you go to uh, uh, restricted use of purpose-grown biomass, sorry, so that, uh, that uh, essentially means that purpose-grown biomass is, is not applicable in this case because there can be inputs like fertilizer or other um, management activities on the land that are um, that, that would create a leakage, i.e. additional emissions of carbon dioxide to the environment that wouldn't otherwise be there under the project conditions. The other is the control of depletion of soil organic carbon, i.e. pulling agricultural residues off the field. If we take that too far, we can actually deplete the soil organic carbon, creating a leakage of carbon loss over here to create a carbon benefit on the other side of the biochar project. Element. The other one is bioenergy production relative to biochar yield. So one thing that is recognized is that uh, with biochar systems, especially the, the, the uh, some of the more um, integrated systems, you can throttle between biochar production and, and oil and, and gas production depending on how you operate the equipment. And thus, there is this sort of leakage around, well, we can produce more biochar today and, and offset more energy going from the grid or from the alternative bioenergy production. So nothing uh, terribly, uh, Interesting here, but just that there's three examples of potential leakage and why the protocol has been, um, why the baseline has been set the way it has and why we've limited that feedstocks to where they happen. So back we go, and this is where I wanted to reference right into the protocol. And I'm not sure how much depth really to go into here, just given the time. But I want to highlight that the baseline condition is a set of, you know, equations split over 15 pages and is, is not really to be underestimated. So what we've done, and I'm going to switch out here to the actual document itself, just see that each equation, each variable is defined both by its unit and by its name and by, in theory, by year. And on pages 31 to 45, it goes through stepwise in terms of how you can estimate or capture that particular data set and then how you use that to calculate the emission reductions at the end of the day. In some cases there's examples to help people work through that. In other cases there might be sample data tables showing um, uh, generic values for uh, for um, some of the values for people to uh, to pull from, i.e. Uh, emission factors. So if we look on page equation four on page thirty four, let's give everybody a second to flip there if they are. I'll look at just the simple default uh, baseline scenario, which is bioenergy production. And you've got the sum of the feedstock that's uh, produced and the methane that would come from it, plus the sum of the feedstock uh, volume and the nitrous oxide emissions that would come from it. So I want to point out that a lot of these equations are actually uh, have commas and, and colons in them because there's actually three uh, greenhouse gases in this protocol that are being tracked. There's the CO2 particularly non-diagenic CO2, there's the methane and the nitrous oxide. And so equations have multiple uh, meanings uh, or, or deal with multiple uh, gases and, and they fall their way through. Further down, equation five is where we bring in, say, aerobic decomposition. So if that material was currently being composted, there would be some emissions under the baseline scenario. They're, they're marginal and we multiply that by global warming potentials to figure out how many uh, tons of CO2 we per year. Six, you can see that the equations become a little bit more intensive. We've got a first order decay model that allows us to contemplate um, the amount of emission reductions achieved and uh, forward account for some of them uh, within the first 10 years in, in terms of the emissions uh, reductions that are saved through the uh, reduction of uh, biomass going to landfill. I think we can all conceptually agree that if you avoid biomass going to landfill where it would turn into methane, this is inherently a good thing. The protocol and the best practice provides us with this equation which accounts for that which would be oxidized and the fact that uh, protocols can't reach too far into the future lest the baseline become a little less uh, uh, robust and, and conservative. I'm going to flip back to the uh, PowerPoint just for a second to recheck the bearings. So now we look at the project condition. So the baseline condition 
is the, is the first half of that equation, the baseline condition is there. We flip down into some of those, we can see um, if, if there's emissions from the combustion of the gas, the biogas coming off the uh, pyrolysis unit, that can be measured on an energy equivalent basis against the fossil fuel in the baseline condition that would have otherwise been used. So we can use attributes that we measure in the project condition, i.e. how much gas was produced and what is the energy content of that gas, and we can relate that back to a volume of natural gas that would have been used, or propane or, or any other fuel that would have been used in that particular circumstance. So if you want to map through the, the uh, project and baseline conditions, there's those two diagrams uh, um, on page 15 and 16 of the protocol that show uh, show the, the sources and sinks, the, the, the various elements of our quantification. You can in some ways match them up, i.e. oil production over here versus oil, uh, bio oil uh, on the other side. And that allows us to make sure that we're not missing anything. So I wanted to just, oh, I never get one slide at a time. I've got two more slides here, really just trying to show the depth within the protocol. So here's uh, Here's one equation parameter that I pulled out, and I pulled it out because it made for a nice slide, not because it's particularly interesting. And this one is, is fairly, it's average temperature at the baseline lagoon site in month M. So this would apply to protocol projects, and I know of one that's taking uh, hog manure, turning that into biochar, where the produ rate of production of methane in the lagoon is dependent on temperature. And so there's a need to manage the temperature and understand the temperature in order to predict under the baseline condition what methane emissions would have occurred in the absence of the project. And so we've got this parameter uh, temperature, which seems kind of, you know, we all know what temperature is and we, 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 we go about our business. But the temperature sensor must be housed in a ventilated radiation shield to protect the sensor from thermal radiation. So what I want to point out there is there's very specific requirements for how often it needs to be taken, how they have the values have to be aggregated. And the number one issue I get with or asked about is why why such detail and really these offsets have to meet the same standards as financial audit and so you wouldn't say well you know the interest rate at the bank was somewhere around two to three percent so I use that in my financials no you need to know the exact uh, interest rate on any given day in order to get your financial uh, you know, to, to, to do the proper accounting and the same thing works in this case so for every parameter, there's a table in there that'll tell you a little bit about how you need to go about it. And I would strongly advise that all those out there that are developing their own projects should go and look at their project and the parameters that would apply, i.e. which baseline is applicable to me, and go through and make sure that each of those data points can be captured. And so if we can do that, uh, then I think we'll have a better understanding of, of maybe if there's anything in there that is difficult to measure in the way we've asked for it to be measured, or you know, we've asked for it for the hourly and it should really be daily or, or, or vice versa. Those are the things that make the protocol usable. Because come in today, whatever's in the protocol is what the auditor will be looking for. Just building on that point, here's two sections out of the data management section of the protocol, is that we are preparing through the use of a protocol and giving the rules for managing our way through a, an audit, which is to the same level as a financial audit. And so record keeping practices, uh, you must keep uh, all the documents, you must keep them as a, in an electronic form and keep a lot of data and keep backups. And you also need to have a QA, QC plan in place which speaks to how this information is going to be held and the integrity of it. Uh, things like Excel spreadsheets are, are becoming frowned upon because they can be edited along the way. And so you need to have access to the base data or the logs that come out of the, uh, the, the the data sets that come right up from the logs. And so the instructions are all here. Some of them appear onerous and, and otherwise, but what they really do is move towards the protocol providing a quantification which is conservative and robust and will pass an audit and therefore create highly credible offsets. So I think that's the end of my slides. I'm, I'm prepared to hand it back over. Um, and someone can work on that as we go. And we'll move on to the, the, the biochar uh, sequestration point, which I pointed out, and then the piece around sustainable feedstock. So thank you very much, and I'll look forward to any questions at the end. Thanks, Keith. This is Debbie Reed. I'm with the International Biochar Initiative. 
I'll discuss uh, um, the biochar carbon stability component of the protocol and how it was developed and um, try to put a, a little more details around the specific um, methodology for determining uh, stable carbon component of biochar. So um, I think we'd all agree that the stable carbon content of biochar is a feature that makes it most promising for use as a climate mitigation technology. So the ability to measure or estimate the stable carbon component of biochar is a critical component of this methodology. As part of the development of the methodology, IBI convened a panel of experts to develop a test to measure just the stable carbon comp component of biochar, since all biochars contain both stable and labile carbon. The methodology developers, including IBI, determined that a test that would not require testing of biochar in soil or in situ over time is necessary to make the protocol feasible and cost effective. So this test methodology will just be performed on the biochar before it is applied to soils. Um, yeah, it, but it will have to be um, done any time um, the biochar is added to soils. Um, so for those who are not really familiar with biochar, pyrolysis actually converts the carbon molecules in biomass, both chemically and physically, into a form of carbon that's similar to graphite. This is the stable carbon component of biochar, and it is very recalcitrant. It degrades far more slowly in soils than the biomass carbon from which it was converted. So before I discuss the stable carbon methodology, I'd like to point out that Appendix 1 of the methodology describes the final test and the calculations for determining the stable carbon component. And um, this has been dubbed by the expert panel as BC plus 100, or biochar plus 100. Uh, which refers to the amount of carbon that is expected to remain in the biochar after a period of 100 years. This is considered stable for the purposes of determining a greenhouse gas emission reduction value or for this offset. Appendix 2 of the methodology describes um, in far greater detail how the stable carbon test method was derived by the expert panel. So to develop the test methodology, IBI gathered 14 experts in different fields of biochar relevant to stability. And they were tasked with obtaining a simple, cost-effective, reliable measure for carbon stability. Also, all assumptions made during the development of the test method had to follow the principle of conservativeness so that um, we would avoid overestimating either the stability of biochar or the content of stable carbon in biochar. As Teresa indicated, the, the expert panel determined that the quantity of stable carbon sequestered biochar with a hydrogen to organic carbon ratio of less than or equal to 0 0.7 allows for a conservative assumption of stable carbon. So the expert panel reviewed 27 available test methods, and then they categorized them into three different groups. The first um, they termed alpha methods, and these are methods which, methods which can reliably estimate BC plus 100 at minimal cost and um, readily available technologies. The second category is beta methods, which are used to calibrate alpha methods and directly quantify BC plus 100. They tend to be more costly and less commercially available than alpha methods. And then the third is gamma methods, which provide the physical chemical underpinning for the alpha and beta methods. The first method, the alpha method, is um, what it will be utilized or what is utilized in the actual methodology. Um, to determine stable carbon. Let's see, I'm not. Could you advance the slide, please? Paul is there. Paul, I'm unable to advance the slide. Yes, I'm here. We're just having some technical difficulties. Give me one second. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.
while you're doing that, I'll, I'll continue um, with my description. So um, what the next slide will show is what the panel did is they reviewed all available incubation studies of biochar um, that were done under laboratory conditions, as well as all um, studies of biochar in soils that were measuring the degradation rate of the biochar. And what they observed was um, a trend in biochar decomposition patterns. And what the slide shows is that um, under incubation experiments and in soil experiments, um, the label carbon component of biochar tends to degrade or mineralize um, until the, it rate, the, the rate of decomposition is fairly stable at around 600 or 700 days. So in other words, the label carbon component will degrade over about the first two years until you reach a stable um, level of carbon. So this became an indication that the remaining biochar carbon exhibits a certain degree of um, stability. Now the incubation experiments that were done subjected biochar to controlled conditions that were made to mimic harsh environmental conditions in soils. So they used, for instance, high temperature and moisture content and added inoculants and nutrients that would tend to mineralize or um, enhance the decay rate of the carbon. Um, and again, after about two, two years, what you see is stable carbon component. Um, I think I'll just continue speaking in the absence of the slides. Um, we have another slide um, that shows uh, what the researchers or the expert panel found was that there's a really strong relationship between the H to C organic ratios of carbon or biochar carbon and the predicted B C plus 100 values. There was a graphic um, that showed that the H to C organic ratios between 0.4 and 0.7 exhibited the greatest percentage of BC plus 100 carbon, or carbon that would remain in soil at least 100 years after addition. So thank you. This I see this slide here. So this is a, um, the slide I spoke to previously, where it shows after about 600 or 700 days, you'll see at the beginning that the high rates of carbon and there's a very rapid decay process until about 600, 700 days it becomes fairly stable. This is when um, you know you have what is remaining is the stable carbon component. Let me see if I can advance this now. Okay, could you, could you advance this slide? Okay, great. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Um, so I was just speaking to this. Uh, this is actually the last slide. I'll go right to this one. Um, so to show the conservativeness principle was applied to the, the test that was chosen, this slide shows that the mean BC plus 100 levels associated with biochars at differing levels of H to C organic values. Again, those that range from 0 0.4 to 0 0.7. Um, and it shows the mean carbon um, percentage in those biochars. If you see the second, the second column is mean. And if you go all the way over to the last column, the chosen value, you can see that what the expert panel did was they chose to show additional um, conservativeness. They chose carbon values that were lower than the means and lower than the lower limit in each case. So that, for instance, when you have a biochar that shows an H to C organic carbon ratio of 0 0.4, which means it's very recalcitrant, will have a high degree of stable carbon, the chosen value that's assigned there is 70. For 70% 70 of the carbon um, is will be the stable carbon value for this test. If you have a biochar that is 0.5 to 0.7 range, 
the chosen value is 50%. So 50% of the carbon in that biochar will be credited under this methodology. Um, and I hope that that explanation makes sense. And um, if not, we can um, I can answer questions at the end. And now I'm happy to turn it over to Stefan Yurka, my colleague from IBI, who will discuss um, the sustainability requirements of the methodology. Okay, great. Thank you, Debbie. I'm Stefan Yurka with IBI, and we'll finish out this presentation with a discussion of the feedstock sustainability criteria. And I'll just begin by saying that this is all <coughs> described in detail in Appendix 4 of the methodology. The overarching goal of the sustainability, uh, feedstock sustainability criteria are to ensure that uh, the benefits of biochar use are not uh, offset um, by any negative impacts throughout the life cycle of biochar production through use. So for this methodology, we're primarily concerned with greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, we alluded to earlier soil carbon loss, potentially via overharvesting of residues or uh, maybe erosion. <coughs> There's also other environmental and social impacts we're concerned with, so uh, those include other forms of soil degradation, for example, soil compaction or, or nutrient loss. Um, uh, land use change. Uh, so we also spoke to the purpose-grown crops, excuse me, purpose-grown crops, um, and the uh, conversion of um, potentially high-value habitats to purpose-grown crops. So that is uh, an exclusion. Uh, biodiversity loss um, could result from, for example, conversion of uh, habitats or other unsustainable forms of feedstock harvesting, and that could all result in uh, impacts to local communities that are dependent on those residues or, or habitats where feedstock's grown. Back a couple of slides. So as a reminder, Bert, uh, excuse me, as a reminder, the allowable feedstocks under this methodology include, but are not limited to, uh, biomass residues from forestry or agriculture, as well as other biomass residues, including municipal solid waste and other biomass-based materials approved for use under the IBI biochar standards. Uh, detailed list of uh, allowable feedstocks under the IBI standards is available in the document itself. So getting into the actual criteria, um, I, I just spoke to the first one, which is that biomass residues uh, can be used. And by residue, we mean byproducts from the ag, forestry, industries, or other related industries. Secondly, no land use change. Uh, can be attributable to feedstock procurement during the previous seven years. This is really to get at the uh, loss, uh, potential conversion of high-value habitat to purpose-grown crops. Uh, there needs to be evidence of no environmental or social impacts from diverting residues for other uses. So in this case, we're asking project proponents to provide an analysis and, and document how uh, feedstock residues may be used by uh, local com uh, communities and ensure that uh, they won't have a detr detrimental impact. There cannot be a depletion of uh, soil carbon stocks. There's a requirement that 25% of residues are left in place. And finally, there needs to be a management and monitoring plan in place that documents the sustainable harvest uh, of residues. At a minimum, uh, that plan should address the avoidance of overharvesting, soil erosion or soil compaction, and water pollution. So a, a couple of additional criteria uh, in the case where 
uh, feedstocks are treated with agrochemicals. There needs to be documentation of that agrochemical use, including uh, application rates and dates uh, and such. Um, and this is really to get at concerns of accumulation of uh, potential accumulation of uh, contaminants in the feedstock. If biosolids are to be used as a feedstock for um, biochar, it, it is permissible under the IBI biochar standards. However, it needs to meet the requirements for biosolids, which essentially uh, means documenting that it's uh, free of heavy metals or other organic pollutants. And of course, biosolids would also have to uh, meet any local uh, regulations around uh, land application. Finally, a uh, chain of custody needs to be documented from harvest uh, location, excuse me, from harvest through to um, biochar production, uh, and that should include um, harvest location, ideally maps or even GPS shape files. So for forestry and agricultural feedstocks specifically, uh, we think those are going to be the prevalent feedstocks under this methodology. There's a few additional requirements. <coughs> Project proponents um, are asked to um, either certify their uh, feedstock under for forest-based uh, biomass under Forest Stewardship Council for ag-based biomass, either Council on Sustainable Biomass Production or the Roundtable on Sustainable Biomaterials. If certification is not chosen, there's also the option to work with an independent third-party forester or agronomist licensed in the jurisdiction where biochar, uh, excuse me, uh, feedstock production is occurring, and that's uh, professional would uh, assess and, and provide a verification statement that there are no detrimental uh, impacts to soil carbon stocks as well as the other uh, criteria listed earlier. For the case of ag-based feedstocks specifically, there's another option to provide peer-reviewed studies uh, or, or soil carbon modeling analyses for that specific feedstock harvest that prove that sustainable removable, removal rates are occurring. So how does all this uh, happen? Um, there is an initial, an initial one-time evaluation at the beginning of each seven-year crediting period. Essentially, the biochar producer We'll work with the project proponent to collect and provide the necessary documentation to the ACR approved validation verification body. And then during the seven year credit crediting period, there, there will be periodic as well as random evaluations for adherence to the criteria uh, at a minimum every five years, and uh, evaluation will happen. And, randomly at the discretion of the project proponent. So that wraps up the formal part of the presentation. I thank you for your attention, and we'll turn it back to Lauren for the Q&A session. Great. Thank you all for that really useful, interesting presentation. Um, I just quickly want to remind folks um, before we get into the Q&A um, how you can ask questions. You can either type your question into the chat box, um, and that will come to me, and I'll ask those to the presenters, or you can click a, the hand button um, that you should see at the top left of your webinar screen, and you'll be called on and unmuted to ask the question yourself. Um, okay, so let's go into the first question that I have here, um, why um, is biochar transport excluded from the boundary? Um, page 22 mentions 
that emissions are minimal given their economic limitations of transporting. However, um, the question, the ant, the asker um, knows of large amounts of biochar being transported thousands of kilometers. I'm not sure who um, should answer that question. Maybe Keith, if you are. No, I'll put my hand up for that one. There's, there's a couple answers to that. Yeah. Can I? Can I? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Perfect. Go ahead. So um, the sorry the there's a couple answers to that. One is that. Yes, the vast majority of biochar is not transported large uh, large distances. Uh, there is some that is, but there is also, if we look at the baseline scenario, which is other soil amendments, there are other soil amendments that are also being transported to niche markets or, 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 or long distances as well. And so I, I think maybe we could uh, uh, chat around whether we need to expand the reason for why there's that sort of equivalence between baseline projects biochar as a soil amendment will move in the same markets and in the same ways that other um, soil amendments are being made, i.e. from one source of carbon, whether it be a compost facility or a biochar production facility, to a use of that, which is a, a set of soils that, that need to be augmented in terms of their carbon um, uh, or their, their productivity. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I have another question here. Um, you, you touched on this uh, a bit, but maybe just to reiterate, um, how did you decide that biochar is relatively inert once it's applied to the soil? There's a large range of stability estimates in the literature, um, and very few studies have been done in the field. Um, the current draft document states that um, hydrogen to organic carbon ratio of less than 0 0.7 is based on laboratory data and therefore it is conservative, but wouldn't it be the opposite because the lab studies are in a controlled environment um, and rather in the field so many other elements are in play and therefore less certainty um, that the, the ratio is an indicator of stability. Um, so maybe Debbie you could take that one. Yes, I'm happy to take that one. Um, and it's a good question. I, I did touch upon it a little. The, the incubation studies and the field studies that have been done um, to look at degradation rates of biochar and the remaining stable carbon component have done, been done under controlled conditions, but they've been, what they've done is they've subjected the biochar to very harsh conditions that tend to not be replicated. Um, outside of the lab. So they're constant harsh conditions such as high temperature, lots of microbes being added and inoculants being added um, to try to replicate if you were in long-term um, highly degradable environments, which um, if, you, if you go through the protocol, I think it's, a, it's, it's laid out um, pretty well in Appendix 2, you'll see, is meant to replicate what we believe to be would be the harshest conditions under which a biochar would be applied in soils. Um, so, and again, at every turn, the um, expert panel made conservative assumptions so that they did not overestimate the amount that would be left and or overestimate the stability. And then finally, I would just add that that stable carbon component, the H to C or carbon ratio, that is measuring what is um, it's what I call the graphite-like portion of the stable carbon in biochar. And if you look at that structure under a microscope, you'll see that, the, again, the, the carbon molecules have physically and chemically transformed themselves, and they've layered themselves. And it, and it appears not unlike graphite, um, which is what um, gives it the stability in soil. So, between the alpha, the beta, and the gamma tests, and our ability to measure that H to C organic ratio, we're confident that the, the um, test is, in fact, measuring stable biochar that will remain for at least 100 years, and in many cases, much longer. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I do have one hand raised here. Um, Bill, Greg, I'm going to 
unmute you so you can present your question yourself. Let's see, I think you should be unmuted now. Um, no, I hit that by mistake at the beginning of the seminar. Oh, okay. That was quick and easy to resolve. Um, okay, so we have another question um, asking, is there a real distinction between torification of feedstocks versus biotar production? Keith, do you want to address that one? Or? Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> sorry. I, I think uh, the protocol itself, or at least 90% of the protocol, uh, minus the carbon sequestration component, could be adapted into torrified wood. And, and in fact, I've, I've got a, an interest in seeing that happen over time. Um, the uh, Myself, uh, just because I'm, I'm a I'm interested in that, that as a project type. But um, the, the disqualifier for torrefaction of wood would tend to be the, um, the stability of the carbon in torrefied wood and the fact that, uh, and maybe I just don't know, but the application of torrefied wood to soils. I haven't seen or heard of anything in that regard, but that means really nothing in the grand scheme of things. Except, uh, you know, for biochar, um, there's a, a strong body of knowledge that I am familiar with about it going to soils. So, Summary could be adapted to torrefied wood, but we have to look at the ability to combust the torrefied wood um, for energy, which would negate the value of the carbon sequestration. Um, so, separate protocol, but similar bones. Okay, excellent. Um, let's see. Um, here's a question. Well. I guess a, a, a couple questions related to um, crediting period. Um, one was asking why the, the seven years and why not longer. I can just quickly address that. Um, you know, ACR chooses to limit the crediting period in order to require the project proponents to um, reconfirm at the crediting period intervals um, for the appropriate project type that the baseline scenario re remains realistic and um, credible and, you know, remains additional so that the, um, the greenhouse gas accounting practice is um, the, the most appropriate for that project type and continues to be the most appropriate for that project type. So it really is just to make sure that that is um, for, it's a requirement to be reevaluated um, and the seven-year time frame um, was chosen for that. Um, the, there's really there's no limit for the number of crediting periods that a project proponent can apply for. So after the expiration of one, they can certainly um, renew their crediting period and continue with the project. Um, and then I guess connected to that, um, there's a question here. Um, let's uh, I'll, I'll put this to Stefan. Um, if the feedstock changes during the seven-year crediting period, will a separate sustainability criteria evaluation be required whenever the feedstock changes? Sure. Um, I would answer yes, um, that absolutely there needs to be a reevaluation of that feedstock based on the criteria that I outlined. Uh, if anyone else from the methodology team wants to jump in and, and confirm that, uh, please do, but um, I believe that will be a requirement. Well, this is Debbie. I would just add that um, under the IBI biochar standards, if there is a material change in feedstock, meaning 10% or more, um, according to how we've categorized feedstock, then you actually have to um, retest your biochar because if, there's, if there is a material change in feedstock, there's a high likelihood that the actual product you're producing will be materially different than um, the prior uh, material pr produced from different feedstock. So we would also require that it be retested um, separate and apart from the sustainability criteria. 
Hey. This is Teresa. And I just wanted to add to that, too, that there'll be ongoing documentation requirements for each of the feedstocks. So that will be up to the producer to collect that information from the source of, of that feedstock and uh, present that at the end of the year or right before they're trying to register their, their credits. Great. OK. Um, maybe this is for Stefan also. Um, by qualified sustainable feedstock, is that, is that similar to virgin biomass? Um, so I would, you know, the, the requirement is that biomass residues are, are used. Um, the criteria out, I outlined basically describe what is meant by qualified and sustainable. Uh, virgin biomass um, could refer to uh, biomass from you know old growth forest or or uh, biomass from some uh, purpose grown crops so you know I guess the distinction there would be what is is uh, meant by virgin um, where we are uh, prohibiting the uh, you know conversion of habitat to uh, purpose grown crops. So I, I don't know if that answered the question, but uh, um, the, cri the, the criteria I outlined on, on the slides really fits into mm -hmm. what the uh, biomass okay. requirements are. All right. Um, Okay, here's another question. Um, what happens to the allocation of CO2 credits if either feedstock or biochar crosses a country boundaries? I'm not sure um, who would like to take that one. Um, well, there's, I'll, I'll take, I think I'll that's take part just, of that. Um, okay. Yeah, there's an ACR part to that question, which is what uh, what what uh, ACR can, can ACR's um, system will uphold. From a protocol perspective, we're largely agnostic to uh, well, we are agnostic to uh, borders and regions, with the exception that as regulations change crossing borders, it adds a layer of complexity in terms of ensuring that you're meeting the requirements of the protocol to be in, in line with labeling or soil application requirements, that, that kind of thing. Various offset systems, though, um, do, like the Alberta offset system does say that projects have to be in, in Alberta. And as, as the markets mature and move from voluntary to compliance, we can foresee that that will happen. And thus, it will impact on, on uh, biochar going across borders. The last piece is if it's going across as um, pure biochar and then being blended in other countries, just keep in mind that the scope of your audit uh, will include the facility in the other country that would have um, the blending uh, occur there. And I can see that being an issue with, say, biochar we're going from you know, the U.S. to China, where there's a significant travel distance and an issue there versus you know going across the border into Canada from the U.S. Where really isn't a, a, a real sort of hard border uh, there. So. Okay. Yeah, and I, I think it, it really um, goes to just a dif real distinct definition of um, ownership um, and, and being able to, regardless of, of transport, being able to um, track and, and count on the um, the evidence shown for the ownership of the, the CO2 um, greenhouse gas emissions associated with the project. Um, 
Okay, here's another question um, perhaps for Stefan. Are residues left behind after forest fires, standing logs, for instance, considered as waste to be used to produce biochar? I would answer yes to that. Um, the, those would be considered residues or, or byproducts. Um, uh, in the analysis, uh, one of the criteria for um, the sustainable feedstock assessment is that uh, there needs to be evidence of no environmental or social impacts from diverting those residues. So, in this case, uh, as long as you know sufficient material is left in the in the forest, um, and then and it would have to be you know documented and, and um, analyzed by the project proponent. Um, I think uh, those feedstocks would uh, pass the sustainability criteria again with the proper documentation. Okay, here's um, a question for um, maybe Teresa can take this one. Um, does the methodology account for heterogeneity in the pyrolysis method itself, in particular temperature used? Um, are there controls for the efficacy of the pyrolysis method and technology? We'd be referring people to the IBI standard on that. Just follow the IBI standard. This is Debbie. The IBI standard actually does not look at technologies. It's technology neutral. But there is a requirement in the, the methodology, the biochar um, offset methodology, that the technology must adhere to all local, uh, regional, and national regulations regulation for air emissions and other potential negative environmental impacts. And if the technology is located in a, de a developing country, then it has to adhere to regulations, um, similar regulations from an industrialized country. Okay. So that is Yes, I think, I think so. Um, here's another question. Um, Debbie, I think this probably can be you as well. Um, can, can you explain why the drop for the stable biochar was chosen um, to drop so strongly from the hydrogen carbon ratio of um, 0.4 to 0.5 and then remains flat from 0.5 to 0.7? Yes, that was um, again the what the that's what the evidence showed, and what the expert panel was doing is trying to utilize the most conservative estimates. So they looked at both the mean value of stable carbon for each of those ratios, and then they looked at the lowest value for each of those ratios. And based on that, and and a desire to be conservative and to adhere to the conservativeness principle, um, they chose the 0.7 and then or the 70 percent and then the 50 percent um, because the 0.4 is a very stable carbon and 5, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, and 0.7 were kind of grouped together as less stable but exhibiting 50 percent stable carbon. Okay, great. Um, here's some, some quick questions on the alpha tests. Um, what is an estimated cost of an alpha test and the time required to conduct it? That's a good question. I don't require the exact cost. Um, I think it was in the range of $100. 
And uh, the time frame was within two weeks. So it was something that could be done quickly and at fairly low cost. Yeah, I would just add, this is Stefan, that these are pretty straightforward laboratory tests for hydrogen content and for organic carbon content, and then essentially just identifying the molar ratio between those two. Um, these tests are uh, routinely performed by environmental and, and soil testing laboratories at low cost, as Debbie alluded to. All right, here. So here's another question. Um, I've seen forest biomass um, include green leaves and needles chipped along with wood in preparing feedstock for pyrolysis. What happens to the phosphorus, potassium, magnesium, and trace elements when this is done? Shouldn't the production of feedstock avoid including leaves, needles, and growth tips in, in order to avoid depleting the soil of such nutrients. Debbie, do you want to, yeah, to take that one or Stefan that one? Or, or? Well, I'll start out and, and say okay. it's, it's a, a valid point. I think, um, you know, for this methodology, we're primarily concerned and have been talking about soil carbon, um, but certainly nutrient, other nutrient macro and micronutrients are important as well, um, and there should be an assessment um, as part of the uh, sustainability criteria to ensure that there's not a, you know, a harmful depletion of, of those nutrients. Yes, I, w I would just add to that. It's um, it is required that you look at that both from a perspective of soil carbon in the case of agriculture residues as well as forestry residues for exactly that reason. Um, in agriculture residues in particular, you're not only worried about removing nutrients, but you're worried about erosion issues um, related to the removal of too many residues. So that is part of the requirement. Okay. Um, I'm going to um, ask Teresa she, to jump in here. She wanted to go back to the question about the, um, the biomass residue um, of remaining from forest fires. So she, there was a quick clarification she wanted to provide on that. I just wanted to clarify that there's no confusion that Stefan was referring to this as biochar feedstock. So what burns in the forest could be used as feedstock to create biochar through the process of pyrolysis. That char out in the forest would not necessarily be biochar itself because it has to go through the pyrolysis process, which limits oxygen while heating the feedstock. Great. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for that clarification, Teresa. OK. Um, Let's see, maybe, Teresa, this, you can start out with this one as well. Um, what do you think um, the role of using precision consultants in the implementation of the biochar protocol during reporting, verification, and monitoring? I guess, is there, what kind of role can those consultants play in, in implementing this protocol? Lauren, can you repeat that, please? Sure. Um, sure. I guess, um, what do you think um, the role of, do you think there's a role of using precision consultants in the implementation of biochar, the biochar protocol during reporting, verification, and monitoring? If you need further clarification, I can um, ask the um, question asker to, to clarify. Are you there, she, may, she, she may be on mute, um, but I would say I, 
I, I would think we need more clarification regarding what exactly is meant by okay. the question. I think so. Yeah, if, if um, the asker would like to to um, clarify that, please do go do go so ahead and do that, and I will um, ask the question again. Um, okay, here's another question. Um, Paige, if Teresa, Teresa, are you back on? Maybe she's having technical difficulties. Maybe Debbie, you can take this. Um, page 19 excludes excludes emission reductions from electricity production where projects are located in developed nations. Um, does this mean there would be no claim of the carbon benefit from, from the U.S. electric generators fueled by syngas from biochar for pyrolysis? Actually, I think Keith should take that one. Okay. Sorry, I just nodded out. Is there a, can you repeat your question? Sure. Um, page 19 excludes emission reductions from electricity production where projects are located in developed nations. Does this mean there would be no claim of the carbon benefit from the U.S. electric generators fueled by syngas from biochar pyrolysis? <coughs> yeah, that's a great question. So in, in the markets where there are uh, electric, electricity regulators are included under some form of GHG regulation, which includes most of, not most of it, but um, includes portions of the U.S. In order for the protocol to be conservative, we had to exclude electricity production because uh, these are typically dealt with through other mechanisms like RPS, uh, RPSs or uh, in California under AB32. So although there are exceptions to this rule, and I think on a jurisdictional basis, if this protocol were taken up by, say, a given province or otherwise, or our state, you could you could look at adjusting that. But in most cases, the electricity production uh, is covered by some other form of, of carbon regulation, therefore is not additional. Not always true, but true enough to, to require us to do it to be conservative. It's uh, also a good practice in places like the protocols going to California to exclude these emissions using direct. So, for that reason. Right. Okay. Um, doesn't the IBI um, maybe let's see, Debbie, Debbie um, or Keith, you can you can take this one. Um, de doesn't the IBI ten percent feed shot, feedstock change requirement favor purpose grown crops, which are not allowed by the methodology? Um, doesn't this provide a dis this incentive to developers to use the most most widely available feedstock in their area at any given time. Um, and if the goal is to avoid purpose-grown crops, why not give sure. project developers more flexibility? I so can start. In, in some cases, um, the, uh... Go ahead, Keith. <laughs> oh, uh, please, please do, Jenny. Uh, well, I, I would just say that the IBI standards actually don't favor purpose-grown um, feedstocks. Um, I, so, and Keith, you can continue. <laughs> For sure. So what I would say is that uh, if, if you're going to bring your project in and you look at the range of feedstocks that are maybe uh, within the realm of reasonable for your, your project, is I would include the broad set up in advance. So it doesn't have to be, well, today we're just using X, so we can only verify against X feedstock. But we know we might have four or five. So in one time of years, we'll be using uh, nut shells, and the other time we'll be using uh, corn stover and, and chicken litter another part of the year. As you can include that range of feedstocks in your project uh, from the day one. And if you, you want to add, then you've got to go and look and add. So it pays to do a bit of sort of planning in terms of where you think your feedstocks are. There is always the opportunity to um, to add projects in any given year. And the idea being that you know, after two or three years, uh, in theory, it should be 80% uh, you know, of the feedstock is covered. As you, sorry, the theory being that as you accumulate, as you, as you add different feedstocks each year, your pool of available feedstocks can clear. Um, but given the range of feedstocks contemplated here, everything from manures to 
um, to shells, to you know, municipal solid or, or municipal food waste. So um, there, had, there needs to be some restriction around the, the change in the biochar quality, I guess, based on feedstock. So it's kind of rock in a hard place. Okay. We'll have a, about um, five more minutes here, so I'm going to try to get a couple new questions in. Um, the point five, um, this goes back to um, Debbie's discussion on the um, hydrogen carbon, organic carbon ratio. Um, the point five had a low point of 62% stability and a high around 70%. Um, of course, I think this is the, the asker recalling what you presented. Um, if we attribute 50% only to this, then people will not have a reason to implement advances that bring their quality up from the lower 0.6 to 0.7. Um, without some kind of recognition, people will have no reason to improve um, a 0.7 quality to a, a 0.5, and we'll, we'll continue with the less quality option. Will this be reevaluated at some time? Yeah, so I'm, I'm not sure the H2C org actually refers to quality unless you're um, equating the, um, the stable carbon component with quality, which is one way of looking at it. Um, but I would say, yes, this, is, this methodology is based on the best available scientific evidence, and we required the expert panel to only look at published, peer-reviewed material in developing this. We know that there are um, many publications that are in review or not yet published, so we're anticipating that in the next couple of years we will actually have far more published peer-reviewed data to draw from and that we will be able to update this and that over time we will be able to increase that value based upon the published evidence. So I, I hope that addresses both issues. But it, again, with the given evidence that we have and the conservativeness principle, I think this was um, the, the best that the expert panel felt we could do. Um, in order to, um, again, strictly adhere to conservativeness and not overestimate how much carbon is being credited. Great. Um, I think we have one time for one more question. Um, and Keith, this will be to you that, um, to re reiterate some of the distinctions that you were making in the presentation about baseline selection. Um, you said that the baseline is a biomass combustion system for energy production, but then talked about several other baselines, including anaerobic digestion. Can you please uh, go over um, how you would select the proper baseline for a project? Absolutely. So um, I think we have there's there's some there's a high level um, answer and then a detailed answer. So we'll start with the, the former, and that is if if you are going and pulling in a feedstock that um, uh, where complexity or uh, where the feedstock is coming from um, in terms of tracking down the data. So you're pulling from multiple sources and it varies all the time, and that's going to be a high burden. Then you would you would move towards the most conservative baseline, which is not to claim any additional emission reductions associated with the um, the use of the prior use or prior treatment of that organic material. Now, conversely, if you were to be co-located at a, at a hog operation where you were pulling a portion or some all of your feedstock from the lagoons, then you would include that in your there. But if you were, you know, if you're operating from construction demolition waste or from uh, forestry residues or whatever it happens to be where lagoons aren't applicable, then you would simply ignore it. It's just a way of adding um, recognition for specific approaches that are relevant to your project. And there's criteria for how you would prove that something is relevant, but there is no criteria for saying why something isn't relevant in that case, because it uh, simply doesn't apply. So I think uh, in, in more detailed approaches, the protocol has, has a bunch of guidance step-by-step step for each one and how and when you would use it. 
If you're pulling from compost, then great. If you're pulling from landfill, then great. If you're pulling from lagoon. If it is otherwise or, or impossible to know, an example I'll give is the guy who shows up at the gate with a bunch of biomass from uh, tearing down a barn on his property and or some construction ends or something, and you don't know where it was or would have otherwise gone, you can simply put it into the bioenergy pile because that's the most conservative, and where there's no records, that's where you would default to. So I hope that helps. Um, and I hope the protocol is stepwise enough for people to work through what applies. But going from one baseline to the other doesn't mean include all. It only means that you wouldn't otherwise multiply it by zero and have it go to zero, i.e. nothing came from a lagoon, so zero is the number times the lagoon, and therefore everything else in that part of the equation goes to zero. Great, thank you. Um, so we've come to the end of our time here. Unfortunately, we couldn't get to every um, question that was asked during this time, but um, as I mentioned before, all of the questions that come in through this um, webinar will be addressed by the methodology authors um, in, the, in the public comment um, process, and those answers will be posted along with the um, methodology itself as it continues to move along the, the um, ACR review process. Um, so with that, thank you so much to all the presenters, and thank you everybody for joining today. And um, again, we will be sending out the presentation and the, the link to the recording um, to all of the registrants, so um, you should receive that in your email in a short period of time. All right, well, thank you all. Take care. Bye-bye.